good afternoon for those ACICS member institutions uh, in the Eastern and Central Time Zone, and good morning to those in the morning uh, in the uh, Mountain and the Western Time Zone. This is Tony Bita, I'm Vice President for External Affairs at ACICS. I want to give you a couple of uh, brief housekeeping items before I uh, uh, um, announce the rest of our participants. Um, all attendees will be muted and must submit their questions in text, and we're asking you to please hold those questions until the end so we have time to focus on the content and the substance of your inquiries. Um, the question and answer session will be archived on our website under Frequently Asked Questions under the Events and Workshops tab at www.acics.org. Joining me this afternoon is Dr. Joseph Gurubatham, Executive Vice President of ACICS, um, Susan Greer, Vice President, and I also have Quentin Dean with me who's a Senior Policy Analyst and will be joining as necessary um, as we get into some of the content of our best practices um, activity. So this we AWARE webinar is about institutional disclosure and the best practices guide that ACICS recently sent out to all member institutions and evaluators and is available on our website. The purpose of this webinar is to get into greater detail and provide an opportunity for, for some back and forth, some discussion about how the evolving expectations relative to disclosures of student achievement data um, is being applied by the Council to our member institutions. And so what we're going to talk about today reflects some recent conversations on policy and procedures and that grew out of a discussion by Council who authorized uh, the information we're about to share with you, the guidance, and mandated that we provide um, that greater degree of clarity. The purpose is to, again, focus on um, the accuracy and the clarity and the accountability of the disclosures uh, of student achievement data by the institutions outside of the regular review cycle. And this data that will be derived from this activity, this new activity, will be collected, analyzed, and presented for review by Council. Specifically, why are we doing this? What gives us the authority or the impetus to get into a deeper review of student disclosure information? In the criteria section 31704, it says that institutions will routinely provide reliable information to the public on their performance, including student achievement as determined by the institution. There's latitude there, but there is also some specificity of expectation. Secondly, um, in standards that are applied to ACICS and all accreditors by the Department of Education, which grants us our authority, it is uh, expected that accreditors will perform effective and continuous quality review between the periodic accreditation review cycles, in addition to supplement the full review that goes on during the accreditation review process. Next slide. And then finally, uh, the Council on Higher Education Accreditation has a specific standard, 12B1, that requires ACICS to have standards or policies that require institutions or programs to routinely provide reliable information to the public on their performance, including student achievement as determined by the institution or program. You see a very close parallel between the language in 12B1 of the CHIA standard and the ACICS uh, criteria, and that's not by coincidence. Both in terms of the flexibility and also in terms of the specificity, we want there to be close alignment so that the data that's produced and the reviews that flow out of this exercise are as relevant to this standard as possible. So what are we talking about in particular? You've heard me use the term review and process a couple times. Uh, specifically, we're looking at beginning in this month to do an online review at the staff level of institutional websites and their student information disclosures, their student achievement disclosures. And 
we will be doing that through a random selection of institutions. We'll be doing several hundred a year, which means we'll probably be doing 50 or 60 a month. They will be picked at random. They, we will exclude from that list any institution that is currently going through the accreditation cycle. We want this to be supplemental to the normal review that goes on during the accreditations, uh, the full accreditation review, not additive. Um, so w we will exclude those institutions that are already up for a a, a site visit, team visit, um, this month or this cycle. They will be excluded. What will we be looking at? Uh, we, will, we will be looking at website disclosure information. We will also take a look at uh, publications that are available through the online access and any advertisements, any commercials that we see uh, on, on the internet or posted on your website. Those are all subject to this level of scrutiny and review by uh, ACICS. Next slide. Um, and specifically, we want to be looking at things such as on-time graduation rates. If you all are using those as part of your disclosures from the department's uh, program integrity rules or the gainful employment regulations or a combination of all of those. The retention and placement rates that you uh, that are derived from data you must collect to report to ACICS and some of you choose to use those also as disclosures uh, for the public and for prospective students. And then finally licensure and certification pass rates. Again, that is an element that comes from the required data that you must collect and provide as part of your uh, institutional effectiveness planning. Next slide. Following the review and analysis at the staff level, the schools will receive a brief written feedback regarding how those disclosures uh, meet council expectations. And again, that will be an opinion and, rec uh, and a recommendation, it's not a finding. But it will be a point of reference then for the schools to provide in writing an opportunity to respond. Whether you choose to respond or not is up to you at this point. This is an exercise that it's not meant to be at this particular point in time, uh, the basis for a council action. This is only for their review and their uh, data collection purposes. And then finally, those findings uh, of the staff review and any responses that are rece received by or provided by the institutions will be reviewed by council so that they have a better sense of how this process is working, where are their weak weaknesses and where are their strengths in the pattern of disclosures being exhibited by our institutions. Because any kind of review of quality and integrity has to have a strong point of reference, uh, we spent a couple months at ACICS at a staff level doing uh, uh, what I will acknowledge as a cursory review. This is not meant to be comprehensive or um, soup to nuts, but a, a very cursory review of some of the types of disclosures and publications that are available through the internet related to student achievement. And we collected that and put it into a document that is called an inventory of best practices, the disclosure of student achievement information. That went to all member institutions um, the last couple, uh, in the last couple of days along with the notice of this AWARE webinar. It is also posted on our website. You can easily download it. It's not a long document, but there's a lot of substance in there, and I think it provides a good point of reference for anybody involved in your enterprise in deciding what to add, subtract, or change, or modify in terms of student achievement disclosures uh, on, on your websites. That's the, that's the purpose of what we've developed. It's to provide you that point of reference. Uh, again, student achievement data is meant to be an important indicator of a post-secondary institution's quality and integrity. And it is most useful, as you will see as uh, the language in this guidance document describes, when it is easy for the consumer to find, when it uses clear and unambiguous language. These are some of the characteristics that we're looking for. That um, lack of easily accessible and clear student disclosure information can lead to confusion and misinterpretation. It can lead to student complaints. It can lead to adverse information that ACICS 
has to process and the schools have to respond to, and also in some cases legal disputes and challenges by governmental authorities. The goal of sharing these best practices and applying them in a way that is informational is to help consumers, among other stakeholders, make informed enrollment decisions based on institutional quality, program integrity, and in particular, student achievement. You'll see that in our guidance document, what we're describing is really three sets of characteristics. The first one is ease of navigation. The second one is information presentation, the way the information is presented. And then thirdly, the richness of the content of the information that's available. So as we review the materials on your website, those are the three categories or, of characteristics that will be subject to the greatest review. So let's take those one at a time so that um, those of you that have not had a chance to read all the materials or absorb it have a at least a top line sense of what is in the guidance document and what this review process will, will entail in terms of content. Number one, ease of navigation includes uh, the disclosure information should be easy to find. I think that's self-explanatory. Um, student consumer information should be, if at all possible, linked, have a link that is above the fold or is, in the alternative, clearly visible on the home page. By the fold, we mean that on a standard laptop or desktop computer screen, if your home page is a long home page and, and the user has to scroll in order to see all of the home page, the preference is that the link to the student consumer information would be on the upper half or the upper, upper portion of that uh, home page. That would be something that would be meritorious in terms of your presentation. And then finally, to make sure, if at all possible, that through a single click, um, the end user will have access to the consolidated disclosures page. The consolidated disclosures page is a term of art. We'll get into a little more detail. Is obviously, or maybe not so obviously, a requirement, but it is a suggestion in terms of how to think about aggregating um, student achievement information. Information may include, under the ease of navigation category, retention and placement rates, as reported to ACICS and licensure exam pass rates to the degree that you are collecting and reporting those. It may also include uh, student, graduate, and employer satisfaction rates. Those are elements that you are required to include in your uh, effectiveness plans but are not currently required to report to ACICS. If you deem those to be something of value to potential students and can and as long as you can back up the numbers that you disclose and you decide to, to include those in disclosures on your website, uh, that in, in, in turn is totally satisfactory. And then finally, when we get into indications of student learning, cumulative GPA performance, uh, the results of comprehensive examinations, capstone projects, graded externships as well, um, to the degree you elect to share some of that information, through uh, student achievement disclosures, as long as you can back up the data that's being presented, um, that falls well within the realm of information that could be helpful to prospective students. And other factors that you may want to consider including. Again, this is meant to be a suggestive list, not a exhaustive list, and how many of these you choose to include or not include is up to the institution. This is meant to be more of an inventory of best practices. Graduation rates would be in, could be included, state level and disaggregated demographic graduation rates, if that's appropriate, if you have to report those at the state level anyway. Any kind of indication of your performance in terms of credit transfer. Um, information about student complaints, which I believe most of you already have um, clearly identified in, on your website, but, but aggregating that as part of this ease of navigation uh, rubric may be appropriate. And then links to the net price calculator or other third party uh, websites that enable a student who's primarily wanting to know how to compare effectively cost of attendance, tuition levels, um, fees, um, financing opportunities, 
to, to not only give them a resource within the institution, but also give them access to other third-party websites where that information is presented uh, relatively uh, benignly and objectively without advocating any particular institution or, or vendor. Um, recently, um, uh, to our amazement, but, but, uh, but in a positive way, CHIA, the Council on Higher Education Accreditation, also opined on their website about some considerations that should be uh, manifest as an institution develops its student disclosures. Uh, they suggested things uh, in these institutional and program profiles, that's what they're called on their website, uh, the date of the next comprehensive institutional and program accreditation review, for example, some brief description of the student population being served, and indicators of effectiveness with undergraduates as determined by, the, determined by the institution. Now keep in mind that third bullet has greatest applicability to those institutions that offer baccalaureate degrees and higher. For associate degrees and program, uh, programs at the diploma or certificate level, uh, that third bullet probably has a, a lot less meaning and, and may not be uh, even practical to provide. Other examples in the CHIA profile, including um, uh, some indication of the student's acknowledgement of their completion of, of their educational goal, including the number of students surveyed and the number who say they completed their goal. So in this case, the student satisfaction uh, information is a little more specific than whether or not they were satisfied. It links back to, were you satisfied that you accomplished the goal? that you had when you were first enrolled in this institution or, or program. Again, that's from the CHIA guidance. Other ideas include average time to certificate or degree, um, the number of graduates ent entering graduate school from your institution, um, the number of graduates entering, um, the, the, the number of graduates and those entering um, graduate school. Um, some indication of success in general education. Again, that's, that is uh, a, indicator that would probably be most appropriate for baccalaureate or higher, educa uh, higher credentials, although uh, many associate degrees also have a general education component, but to the degree that students express some uh, success or satisfaction with the general education content, CHIA deems that as, a, as, a wor as worthy of potential disclosure. And then finally, success in the major field. So some best practices examples of, of websites that we found in our, again, our cursory review that seem to demonstrate those, uh, those characteristics that we just talked about. Uh, one of those is uh, DeVry, which is um, displayed on the screen. It has a lot of characteristics that, um, that uh, were attractive to us and that we thought were worthy of sharing. I'm going to ask uh, Quentin Dean, who did a lot of this online review, to give a little bit more expanded explanation of what he found exemplary in this particular website. Hello, this is uh, Quentin Dean. Um, one can say for sure that this uh, website displays uh, what we em emphasize a lot here in this uh, best practice, which is the ease of access. Uh, all the information is gathered in one place. You have access to gainful employment disclosures, graduate employment information, uh, net price calculator if you choose to include that, um, student diversity information, and anything else. Um, this information is available, uh, easily accessible on the home page. Uh, students can clearly see it, and um, they won't have to do a search uh, or uh, try to look at different pages to get the information. It's clear, it's easy to see uh, in a couple of clicks. Here's another example uh, of a school that uh, Madison Media Institute, I'm not quite sure how clearly you can see it on your screen, but at the very top you have um, a disclosure of the number of students in this particular program, video and motion graphics, 20 students, the on-time completion rate ratio, uh, 80%, and also placement in, in the field, uh, 75%. And below uh, the uh, chart, you can see a description of the placement in field definition, which makes it really clear for the student 
uh, or perspective um, student to understand what it means and what it entails. And they kind of lay out that the grad is deemed placed when the graduate predominantly graduate's predominant component of the job requires use of skills learned in the program. And I'm now going to turn you over to uh, Anthony Bida. Thank you, Quentin. Good job. Um, so in terms of the characteristic of information presentation, um, or excuse me, in terms of disclosures, what are what are some um, uh, activities that fall short of a best practice? Things that would catch our eye if we're doing this review, and that would be placing the disclosure information more than two clicks away from the home page. We will make note of that and give you feedback on that. Requiring a search engine a search to locate the disclosure pages. If it's that cumbersome and that involved, um, we will make note of that as well and let you know that that's what we found. And then finally, providing gainful employment disclosures uh, using the standard grid or table that uh, the department requires, but having that table um, filled with not applicable because the program size was too small to fall within uh, the required uh, disclosure, that is as good uh, perhaps as having nothing disclosed in terms of student achievement. So we're watching for those kinds of things and we'll give you feedback in that regard. Um, the next category, the second category of best practices has to do with the way the information is presented. Characteristics that we're looking for uh, include information that's presented clearly, that gives a quick and clear overview of the student achievement information. Um, the U.S. Department of Education's gainful employment template when it is populated and perhaps when it is supplemented by some explanatory narrative also is uh, a way to present information that we think uh, is a step in the right direction. Certainly supplementing any kind of numeric information with infographics. That's the fancy way of saying graphs, charts, anything that has some illustrative value rather than just plain numbers adds uh, clarity in terms of the presentation of the information. And then make sure that in any event the information is presented in a way that avoids, I hate to use negative terms, but avoids creating false, misleading, or exaggerated impressions. So the positive of that is presented in a manner which adheres to truth and accuracy that is that has great clarity and does not and, and does not exaggerate uh, the representations. I'm going to turn it back to Quentin now and let him describe a couple of, of best practice examples that we found for the information presentation category. Quentin. Hi, this is Quentin Dean again. Here's an example of a school at Newmont University who has made uh, great progress in uh, disclosing information to students and making it one of their primary uh, ways of uh, sharing information and uh, making it attractive for students to understand what they're getting, what they can expect, and uh, what they can expect when they when they finish their degree. Uh, as in on this uh, particular page, you can see um, information on the Bachelor of Science in Computer Science. And each program has this information. Uh, they disclose uh, how much it costs, the cost of books and supplies. And on the right, you'll see um, uh, the placement rate. Uh, all in one easily accessible information. And if you'll go to the next page uh, in this presentation, you'll see uh, how Newmont University has elected to use infographics, clearly visible, quick uh, information that the student or the person who's going to help with the um, decision where to to, uh, to study can see uh, in a note, in one second uh, what the information is that's valuable. You know, the salary scale. Uh, how many students have landed a job in their particular field, and also the um, how many people have been enrolled, the level of men and women out of state, uh, the number of faculty. And this information makes it uh, easy for the student to understand what they need. You can go to the next slide. Um, here's another example. Uh, each school can decide for themselves how they want to portray this information. New England Culinary Institute. And mind you, a lot of these schools are not, we chose schools that were the best uh, that we could find. 
And they're not only ACICS accredited schools, but from regional accreditors as well. This particular school, New England Culinary Institute, has disclosed what the uh, Department of Education rules are. And in, in that language, in the narrative, disclosed the uh, placement and graduate information. And on the next page, you'll see um, they make very comprehensive lists. We did an excerpt of a couple of programs, but this, when you click on this link on the website, the link is very long and comprehensive and gives you information on graduation rates, rates placement rates, uh, retention rates for each program. Uh, and it's very clear for the student to know what they can expect when they finish this program. I'm going to now turn you over to Tony Bida. Thank you. Thank you much, Quentin. Um, I think that gets us two thirds through the way, uh, two thirds of the way through the uh, characteristics that we're evaluating. The last one we want to we want to talk a little bit about is the characteristic of uh, information content that is rich. That there's richness there. That there is um, some gravity and some uh, credibility um, attached to the disclosures. That it's not uh, viewed as superficial or um, just self-serving. So how do you achieve richness of information content relative to student achievement? Well, a couple things. Number one, consider providing information from more than one source, more than just from your creditor or from your own institutional data. There may be other sources of information about your institution that are also relevant. Uh, and helpful, and don't hesitate to identify those and link to those. Secondly, information that puts data into context and increases overall understanding. We assume, and probably erroneously so, that um, most of the world and most of the current and prospective students understand the nomenclature and vocabulary that we use in post-secondary education as well as the vocabulary of accreditation and that is a huge mistake. So if you're going to disclose any of that information, don't hesitate to try to add some narrative that further explains it in plain English and increases overall understanding of why this data is being collected, what its primary purpose is, and how it is used to make decisions about how to run the institution and also to, if it's accreditation related, uh, make determinations about the quality and integrity of the institution. Third would be campus-wide information on student achievement. Uh, this is another uh, area where uh, there's there's value in in focusing on campus-wide rather than just a single program. I think it gives it a more uh, complete portrait of how the institution is doing. And then finally, consider participating in third-party websites such as the Voluntary System of Accountability College Portrait System that is included, material in the link is included in the guidance document. As far as we know, there is not a comparable system available right now for nationally accredited institutions. This Voluntary System of Accountability College Portrait System is very user-friendly and uh, very easy to use, but right now it's restricted only to regional regionally accredited institutions. So we'll, we'll do some more diligence and see if we can find other third-party systems that are not restricted to regionally accredited institutions. And if um, providing your data to the, that type of a website enhances the disclosures to students and your disclosures of student achievement, that is something to uh, consider as well. And I'm going to turn it back to Quentin for the last couple of slides and examples. Quentin. This is Quentin Dean again. Uh, here's another great example of uh, a school, a community college, a part of the California community college system. And each school has the same information displayed. Uh, you can just go one click down, you get the access to the different schools. And uh, basically, they have a one page sheet uh, that discloses this is the top part right here. Uh, you'll see uh, gender information age-related information, ethnicity, and then also um, uh, full-time faculty, uh, student counseling ratio, full-time equivalence among students. And then if you go to the next slide, 
they break down their information are very comprehensively. You have probably more information than the general student will need or that will make use of. But it shows you um, uh, firsthand that the school is the expert that knows the student population that they serve uh, more than anyone else. Uh, you have an opportunity to really speak authoritatively about the types of students that you have, their retention levels, how well they do, and you become a trusted resource for this type of information so that a state and other uh, local authorities will come to you for guidance and information about your student population. You are really the, the key to uh, giving this information uh, profile and highlighting it on your website. As you saw earlier with, uh, for instance, Newmont University, uh, it is a, it's a way for really to communicate directly and powerfully with students. You don't have to do a very elaborate uh, website like Newmont, but you can do a simple one page uh, with information. Here's an, ex an example of an ACICS accredited school that clearly puts out all the courses that they offer to students in different levels from associate to bachelor's and even diploma earlier on. And the number of students that graduated, the retention level, placement level is clear and simple. You can add infographics, but that's all you really need is to make your information readily available and clear without any compromises. And that will satisfy ACICS, students, and state authorities as well. Next slide, please. Here's uh, one of my favorites, uh, Colgate University, not an ACICS accredited school. But uh, in one simple fact sheet, uh, they have made it very um, interesting and uh, to watch to see, both for students and for parents. They can see the number of graduates. They have you know, a couple of infographics, you know, where it's located, uh, student to faculty ratio, average size of each class, with you know, highlighting the numbers. And it's very attractive and makes it uh, something that's useful to students. In this day and age of uh, fast information, you want to make the information as presentable as possible and uh, use it as an advantage to your organization. Next slide, please. Finally, let me turn this over to uh, Tony Bida again. Okay, thank you, Quentin. Uh, we're coming down the home stretch here, folks. Uh, thank you for your patience. Um, I just wanted to s summarize and hit the highlights again one last time before we go into Q&A. And we are interested in having some discourse with you all uh, over the next half hour to um, see what the level of interest is, where the areas of concern or areas of confusion, so we can be even more clear. Uh, so in summarizing, I want to say that this initiative of reviewing online the uh, student achievement disclosures supports the institutional compliance with uh, general minimum standards and more importantly supports ACICS's uh, push for re-recognition both by the Council on Higher Education Accreditation and the U.S. Department of Education. It also strength, strengthens and achieves greater credibility and trust with students and the general public. We know that there is, is a lot of um, scrutiny and review externally of the institutions and the accreditation discipline from a variety of sources. Uh, we believe this demonstrates that we have the capacity to enhance those areas where there is the greatest demand for additional information and clarity. That it provides an opportunity for a clear and prominently placed statement of institutional commitment to consumer education through adhering and, and following some of the guidance in this best practices document and that it reinforces the value of presenting this information that students uh, can use at their discretion to make enrollment decisions with openness, openness, honesty, and transparency. So with that, I would like to open it up for questions and we will stay here uh, until uh, the top of the hour or until we've exhausted the questions. So let's see, number one, uh, first question. Mm -hmm. 
Will the review include an audit of compliance with individual state reporting requirements for public disclosure? In, adi in addition, some states require some degree of disclosure concerning accreditation reports on a particular institution. Sounds like California. Will this process help comply with these types of requirements? So that's a good question. Um, and uh, the part of the answer is, is that in some cases, um, uh, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. We know that there is complexity and nuance and even in some cases contradictory guidance that institutions have to follow in this regard if they're not only following guidance from the Department of Education as part of their fulfillment of Title IV requirements and requirements by the accreditor, but on top of that, in some cases, states are also imposing some requirements uh, and 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 the uh, integrity of those disclosures are always subject to greater scrutiny by stakeholders that we can't even anticipate. So because of that, we're going to keep our initial review of the student disclosure information very simple and very much linked to the guidance document that we've provided. We do not have, for a variety of reasons, we do not have expertise nor do we have the capacity to develop ongoing knowledge and up-to-date knowledge of what is required in, at, at any state level for any kind of program or institutional disclosure. So we will leave that in your capable hands and we will not opine either in writing formally or informally because that is not our area of expertise. But I, I appreciate the question because I know you all are thinking about how this guidance and um, showing some recognition of the guidance from ACICS either conflicts with or enhances your ability to demonstrate that compliance with the other folks that are giving opinions about what you're disclosing. Uh, next one. Uh, to print this presentation, any um, suggestions? To print this uh, presentation, it will be available on our website under Aware Webinars. And right now, there's also a flashpoint uh, on our website that gives you access to the uh, information about the best practices as well. We'll make sure that it's easily accessible uh, on our website for your view and use. Thanks, Quentin. Next question. If our website falls short in terms of best practices, is the institution considered out of compliance with ACICS standards? I knew that question was coming and I'm glad it came early. So again, just to emphasize, this is meant to be an information exchange between ACICS, member institutions, and our council so that the council can make some informed decisions about if and when and how it might want to make any modifications to its compliance standards, particularly relative to uh, the only explicit standard that says, um, that, that gives direction to the schools, that is uh, an area of potential uh, non-compliance, and that is criteria section 31704. Would the council, in, after they've gone through this data, uh, one or two or three cycles decide to modify or make that criteria section any more specific. I suppose I suspect those are possibilities, although they haven't they have not articulated that. There's so many other things that can be done to share information with institutions about what is an effective way to display student disclosure information without getting into a formal uh, compliance issue. That I think we will be looking to exhaust all of those other mechanisms of feedback long before it becomes part of a formal accreditation decision, the basis for a, a deferral or the basis for some kind of other restriction placed on your accreditation. We are a long ways away from that. Next question is what does the school have to do to respond back uh, to feedback from ACICS about its website? Uh, the response mechanism will be included in the information we send you if we review your institution and it will it will um, show you the format and the uh, structure of the response and it will be fairly simple and fairly direct. We want to keep this very informal and uh, directly to the points 
that are being discussed in the review and not make it much more elaborate than that. But if you're not selected uh, in the next month or two based on the random sample, you won't see that feedback me mechanism until you are, uh, your institution is selected at random. Next question. What popular information system, or what student information systems are popular for assisting in preparing this data? We're looking to change um, systems. I think that is a great question, and we will add that to our list of additional research. I have no recommendations to make at this time. I know there are many um, sophisticated systems out there that are uh, trying to be more relevant and helpful to the managing of post-secondary institutions, which ones are actually able to link that data collection to the ability to generate disclosures for their websites, we have no idea. But thank you for asking that, uh, for directing that line of inquiry. That is an area where we will look at some additional. Or, or another suggestion is look at, uh, reach out to some of the institutions that uh, we showed as examples, uh, both in the webinar slide deck and also in the inventory of best practices student achievement guidance document and see if they can give you some 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 sense of how they collected that information. I assume that uh, absent that kind of a system, someone or ones are going to have to be assigned to do some manual data collection and scrubbing and formatting, etc. The, to the degree that data is already collected and it can be formatted uh, mechanically or through the software, um, so much the better. Next question. Uh, can you tell us again where we can locate the best practices document on the ACICS uh, website? So on the home page, there was a, uh, at the top of the website today, yesterday and today, there is a flash piece, uh, a, a graphic element at the very top that gives profile to the webinar today and the best practices um, guidance document. If you click on that, up will pop a link where you can um, click on the link and download the PDF, I believe it's a PDF, of this uh, guidance document. And if you have any other problems finding it, please send me an email or Quentin Dean an email and we'll, we'll um, attach it to a response email and get it right to you. Uh, again, a, a duplicative question on can we get the PowerPoint presentation. I, I think we, we answered that, but we'll get back to that one in a minute. Um, is it acceptable to include some of the more comprehensive and detailed information on the PDF document that is linked from the con, uh, student consumer information page? Um, I would be open to um, considering that. I think in many cases, if your student disclosure information um, is already available in a uh, published PDF that giving direct access to that PDF through your student disclosures page, either on the home page or one uh, click in, would be, uh, would be would be a very satisfactory satisfactory way to show um, deference to this guidance. But I think until we see the specific circumstance, we won't know for sure what is. Uh, what is the best answer to that regarding the use of a PDF uh, as a disclosure? Um, does advertising mean Facebook also? Good question. We are not currently planning, uh, because we have limited resources and limited personnel, on doing a, a, a scan of any kind of representations um, in the social media. Because there's so much social media out there and so many different kinds of social media, we could spend a couple hours on a single institution's disclosures before we exhausted all those. So instead, we're just going to be looking at the URL, the home page, uh, the URL that's manifest in your uh, ACICS directory information as our starting point. We're not going to get into all of the other social media links. That may be coming down the road at some point, but I'll be honest with you, of all of the scrutiny or um, criticism that has been applied to the sector about disclosures, I have not heard of a single instance, and maybe it's because I'm out of the loop, I personally have not heard of a single instance where information on Facebook or on LinkedIn or on Twitter or some other site was the primary reason why this the institution was being criticized. 
um, and hopefully we can keep it that way, but it won't be on the basis of us reviewing that information at this point. That one's duplicative. Okay. Statistical information is great for the consumer. Does someone verify the accuracy of what's submitted, and if so, uh, what frequency? So the, the information, statistical information that you provide on your website, particularly if it's subject to public disclosure, um, should be verified or should be subject to accuracy tests internally only. Just like the information you submit to ACICS, absent the, uh, the, the PVP program, the Placement Verification Program, uh, there's an expectation that the institution itself will t take some measure to make sure that it's accurate and reflecting actual performance, as well as retention, as well as licensure exam pass rate, as well as all of the self-reported data that institutions provide to the U.S. Department of Education through IPEDS. The expectation is trust. The additional expectation is trust, but in some cases, verify. The depth and the breadth of that verification is still being developed, but I believe the best guidance is if you're disclosing numeric information on your website that is meant to represent in any way institutional performance or student achievement performance, you have to be prepared to defend the accuracy of that information if challenged. We're, we are not prepared to challenge that at this point. We're not going to get into that level of detail. Um, so if we see a, for example, a, a placement number that looks extraordinarily high, or a, let's say, a, uh, um, the salary level of the first occupation after graduation number that looks extraordinarily high, we may flag that in our response, but we're not going to go to any effort to verify it. That's not our role. We don't have the capacity to do that. And that one's, um, yeah, that one's duplicative. You mentioned an issue with disclosing data for small program sizes, and the GE template is set up to disclose, not to disclose due to privacy reasons for any cohort less than 10. Uh, we do not have an option. So I understand that totally. The question is, is that if we do a thorough review of your website for student disclosure information, and the only thing that we find is the gainful employment template that is a blank shell, we will give you some feedback in that regard. So the GE template, whether it's filled out or whether it's a blank shell, um, is a requirement. You have to do that in a way that meets the requirements of the department. However, there is nothing that prevents you from disclosing more than that. That's the reasonable um, expectation that attached to the GE template. I wish the department had um, actually consulted with institutions and accreditors before they came up with uh, not only gainful employment, but more importantly, the template that they're being, that they're requiring as part of the compliance with this new regulation. I'm not really sure, as it's been implemented so far, uh, it can be said that this template adds a lot of clarity or or um, manifest any of the three characteristics we just talked about relative to helping students do a better job of making enrollment decisions. But that one is out of our hands. It's just an additional piece of information that we have to take into consideration because we know many of our institutions are including that in their student achievement um, website. And we appreciate that question. It's, it, it's, it's a uh, additional complicating factor that I'm not sure we fully appreciate its dimensions. Currently, we disclose placement and graduation rate, uh, and that is based on state requirement, which has a different reporting period. Do we need to disclose both rates from ACICS and the state? My sense is, is that the institution gets to choose. If you want to disclose both, then I think you are under some obligation to clearly footnote or offer explanatory information as to, number one, why you're disclosing both and the difference between the two and why there's a difference between the two in terms of methodology or uh, different reporting periods or for whatever. Um, obviously, if there's a third or a fourth different way to collect and disclose placement and graduation rates and you have all four on your website and you're providing explanatory information comparing and contrasting all four, it is going to be a huge morass of information for a consumer to wade through. But in some cases, we understand you all don't have an option and if that's the case, we will take that into consideration. That is still meaningful feedback and information that we find, we find will be of value. 
Uh, next question, what is the effective date? So the effective date is right now, immediately, uh, starting tomorrow or next week, your institution could be selected at random for this online review. And in that case, you would receive some fee written feedback from ACICS uh, within, let's say, a couple of days after we've done the review. And then you, in turn, would have the standard interval to provide some kind of written response. So that information that we collect and review and the feedback from the institutions then will be packaged to the, together, summarized, and go to the council for their review in December. So they have a better sense in aggregate not individual institutions, but in aggr aggregate, what is this exercise producing in terms of quality of data, and more importantly, what is the meaningfulness of the data? If a school is found not to meet the standards of institutional disclosure, will it be given a time frame in which to remedy the deficiencies before sanctions are imposed, and have sanctions or other negative actions been developed for schools not bringing their disclosures up to standard? Again, beyond the standard uh, articulated in 31704, that your institution shall routinely provide reliable information to the public on performance, including student achievement as determined by the institution. There is no other criteria. There is no other um, standard of review that will be applied to um, the websites during this process. Now, there are other standards that apply, of course, during the regular accreditation review as the site teams are looking at all the different dimensions and, and looking for indications of integrity, indications of, uh, of uh, promising employment, uh, all kinds of, of um, incidents or situations that may rise to the level of a finding in a team report. That's not what we're doing here. What we're doing here is just focusing on the, the uh, guidance document that we've provided and how closely it matches the requirements of 31704. So any, any talk at this point about sanctions, what those sanctions would be, how they would be imposed, let alone the time frame for an institution to respond to a potential um, sanction uh, has not been discussed, nor is it even being contemplated. What's being contemplated is the creation of an orderly way for dialogue to occur. Feedback from our review, from the ACICS review, going to the schools and giving the schools a chance to respond. At this point, let me emphasize, the school response to our findings or recommendations is optional. We recommend, of course, that you do respond because we want the council to see both what we found and the institution's explanation for what we found, as well as to this um, question, if the institution has plans, now that we've gone through that exchange of information, to remedy any deficiencies, what those plans are. That is all very helpful information to go, for the, to, go to the council for their ongoing um, discussion. Next question. Uh, we mentioned uh, or listed out licensure and certifi certification pass rates, but the metric's not currently on uh, the gainful employment template. Is this a specific ACICS requirement, uh, for example, a website disclosure of licensure pass rates? Um, first of all, licensure exam pass rates, I don't believe were even included in the last campus accountability report, or are they? Okay, so was that the first time? So licensure exam pass rates have, in fact, been uh, collected as part of the Campus Accountability Report for the last couple of years. But there is nothing in our standards or in our expectations, uh, including this guidance document, that they be disclosed on the website. It's up to the institution to decide if your licensure exam pass rates is an element that is uh, of student achievement information that is worthy of consideration by the general public, other stakeholders, and prospective students. is We, we merely list it as uh, one bit of data that you're already collecting. If you elect to then use that as part of your student achievement disclosure, by all means, feel free to do that. But the caveat has to be attached is um, that data, at some point, will be subject to scrutiny either by ACICS or, more importantly, it could be subject to scrutiny by third parties that neither you nor I, nor, nor the institution can 
uh, predict. So be sure if you elect to, to use that, you have backup data to, um, to be able to defend its accuracy. I think that goes true for any numeric numbers that are used. Um, we encourage you to, to collect the backup data and to hold on to the backup data just in the event someone challenges it. Okay, next question. Does ACICS plan to disclose institutional results collected from schools via the CAR process on the ACICS website? That's an interesting question because um, it, it involves both a yes or no answer, which has to be really confusing. The yes is that we already disclose aggregate institutional CAR data on our website. It's called the annual key operating statistics document. And you'll see in there, there is ag aggregate data regarding placement, retention, and other elements of the uh, institutional performance, including institutional characteristics, uh, the programs that are, that are offered most frequently, the programs that get the largest enrollment, a lot, of, um, a lot of quantitative information regarding finances. So we, make, we, we have no plans to change that aggregate content in the KOS, nor do we have any plans to add any additional disclosures at the ACICS website of uh, either an aggregate or right, um, but but no other um, action at this time. Now, one of one of my colleagues has pointed out that a best practice for us would be at ACICS to go into, and always the question is who's going to do this to go into the directory information for each and every one of our institutions and make sure that the URL that is captured on, in our data and therefore is displayed on the ACICS website when an end user makes a directory search is the URL that links directly to the student achievement information disclosure on that institution's website. Um, that is pr probably something we need to do down the road how we're going to do it and how quickly we're, we're going to do it uh, has not been determined. Obviously, that would be a best practice that applies to the accreditor, not to the institution. And figuring out how to do that um, will be the next step. But the first step, the reason we're not going to that step now, is we want to make sure that if we start having links directly from ACICS directory information on our website, to a member institution's student disclosure, student achievement disclosures website, the content of what the end user is finding rises to the highest possible level. We don't want to be have our website sending end users to an institution's web page that falls sh well short of even minimal best practices. That does neither the institution any good or ACICS any good. But but good question. A few more questions. Um, dear colleague letters are very specific and note that we have to disclose whether our accreditor, uh, to disclose whatever our accreditor requires us to. Regional accreditors in our state doesn't require disclosure of placement rates, among other things. It would be more helpful to not use regional accredited colleges in your next webinar and only use ACICS colleges and institutions. Point well made and point taken. Thank you. Next question. Once the institution has a review and then ACICS provides written feedback, how long does the institution have to update the website? Um, at this point, we have no plans to do a follow-up check on the website. If that changes and we're able to establish that additional protocol to our recurring process, we will let you know the length of time you have. But that length of time will not be an interval that um, would subject you to sanction if you fail to meet that interval. It would only be a suggestion anyway to say sometime in the next two weeks uh, it would be helpful if we could see modifications to the following elements of your website in the following manner. Uh, but in terms of our capacity to check on that right now on a regular basis, um, that goes beyond the scope of what we've, we've, we're set up to do. A good question. Uh, so we have some other um, questions or some other comments here. Um, we, we will collect those and make those available to everyone to the degree there are websites and, and other uh, resources that are being shared by our, by our, our by folks that are on the webinar. 
for all our institutions. Uh, thank you for providing that. Does the method of determining the information need to follow ACICS formulas for annual reporting, or can it be any formula set by the institution? Um, the formulas that we use relative to the CAR and th that, uh, that information, uh, and that applies to uh, specifically retention and placement rates, is the formula you should use if the information, if the if the data you're disclosing is as reported to ACICS, it should comport with that formula. If it's if that's not the replacement and retention data that you're uh, disclosing, and I'm not sure in every state there's a requirement that it be that which is uh, reported to the accreditor, although I do believe the department requires that it be the information reported to a creditor, then you can use whatever formula you want. But I would be very circumspect and very careful in deviating from that formula for those per two particular indicators because it probably will cause you some problems at some point. I think we're going to wrap it up at this point. We're at three. Uh, we're at three o'clock, one hour. We have a few questions left. This has been a great uh, exchange and interchange. I hope you've, you have found it helpful. Um, you have my email, I think both on the slide deck and on the website. You have Quentin's email. We will be uh, most directly involved in conducting these reviews and providing feedback to the institutions and then getting the information back from the institutions that elect to respond and packaging that for council review. So this is a brave new experiment. It is it is uh, a, a new process. Uh, we'll learn as we go, and we look forward to your um, cooperation and collaboration in making this an effective tool for improving the quality and the clarity of student um, disclosures. Um, you also see that um, the information about this is available um, at www.acics.org, information about how to view the slides and, it, and how it appears under events and workshops, webinars, and then finally the AWARE button. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time.